It was great hearing you play and, and sing. If you'll take your Bibles to likely the most uh, familiar and loved psalm of the psalms, the 23rd psalm, the 23rd psalm, and we'll read the psalm in its entirety. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, thank you for preserving your word. Thank you that you've not only given us the written pages describing the shepherd-sheep relationship, but thank you that your son came, the living word, and became our shepherd, our good shepherd, our chief shepherd, our great shepherd. And we're so grateful, Father. And May you guard us from the familiarity of this psalm, even the familiarity of the truths that we may hear. And may we be touched afresh with the wonder of the great creator who would become redeemer and then own us as his sheep. And so, Lord, we just thank you again for allowing us to be here tonight. We thank you for uh, the word and the spirit who's promised to teach us. May Christ increase and may we see him afresh with the encouragement of our own souls. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, John Stott, uh, he said one time that the chief occupational hazards of the Christian is depression, or I should say is depression and discouragement. And I would add to uh, Stott's statement, uh, disappointment, is that The chief occupational hazards of the Christian are depression, discouragement, and disappointment. And you will uh, find those in places where you shouldn't look. Uh, And there are four places that you are to put your eyes upon, or I should say you could put your eyes upon. And the first three will lead you to what Stott uh, has uh, rightly said are the occupational hazards of a Christian. And every one of us uh, know this by painful experience. If we look to the world, we're going to meet with great discouragement. And if we look to people, we're going to meet inevitably disappointment. And if we look to ourselves, and if we see ourselves aright, uh, we should meet depression. But if we look to Jesus, the fourth place, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, if we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, uh, then we're always going to be met with encouragement. And I would say, as I, in my own walk with the Lord, that through the years, that that's probably the greatest discipline you must establish as a Christian. You must learn to keep your eyes uh, in the right place. You must learn to look in the right place. Uh, And that, uh, obviously, not literally, but spiritually, by faith, you must fix your eyes on Jesus, as the hymn would say. You must set your affections on things above, uh, even the person above. Because if you do look to the world, you will find great discouragement. And if you look to people, and the danger is looking more and expecting more out of people than they can ever give you, you will be met with disappointment. And if you do look to yourselves, and you spend time looking at yourselves, not in a morbid way, but in a realistic way, you're going to see all the failures, and you're going to see all the very things uh, that will lead you to depression unless you're able to fix your eyes upon Jesus. Now, when I say looking unto Jesus, I'm not talking about some mystical experience, some ideological. uh, It's very practical because the Bible's practical. And when I say looking unto Jesus, it's learning to fix your heart and your mind on the various roles that he fills in the Christian life. One of my concerns in Christendom is that Christians never mature beyond seeing Jesus as Savior is that they don't see him in all the wonders of the different roles that he plays in their lives. For instance, looking unto Jesus, not only as Savior, but as ruling king. Looking unto Jesus as your high priest, as your teaching prophet, as your elder brother, 
as your head, as he is the head of the body, as our husband, as we are his bride, as the vine, as we are his branches. And we could spend the rest of tonight and, and longer just identifying all the splendid roles that the Lord Jesus plays in the role, lives of his children. And I want us to look tonight at another role, and that is of shepherd, of shepherd from the 23rd Psalm. Christians throughout history, and even you in this room, and those under the sound of my voice, in the darkest of times, and in the suffering that you've had to go through, you have found the Psalm, the 23rd Psalm, a very real balm for your wounds. You have come to the Psalm as a herding sheep, beaten by the world, beaten by people, not physically, but worn down just by your own sin, and you have found Psalm 23 to be the balm for your wounded soul. And so as we look at this role of the Lord Jesus as shepherd, uh, this has long been established, the relationship. Psalm 100, verse 3, which is often used as a call to worship, says, know that the Lord, he is God, it is he who made us, and we are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. God has long recognized, as I just mentioned, the shepherd-sheep relationship in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. What we read in Psalm 23 is not new, is not new. John Calvin said, quote, in Scripture, God often takes to himself the lowly picture of a caring shepherd inviting us with tender gentleness to rest in safety under his guardianship, end quote. And get the word that Calvin used, tender gentleness. That's what we want to see of the Lord Jesus tonight. And it's not, uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it carries throughout the scripture in the most comforting chapter of Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 40, verse 10, behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. If you're a Christian tonight, that's a picture of your God. That's a picture of the shepherding heart of, of our God is that he would take us as, as lambs in his arms and carry them in the gentleness of his bosom. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 is a great chapter on shepherds. We won't read the first part of Ezekiel 34 because it's a scathing, a scathing indictment against the shepherds uh, of God's people, the human shepherds, their leaders. And God is, is, is heavy handed upon the shepherds because they've been self centered and they fed themselves and not the sheep. And this is what God says will do, he will do. Well, he deals harshly with those shepherds, and he will in our uh, disposition as well. Harshly, not in a punitive way. But, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But notice in verse 34, and don't turn to it, in verse 11 of chapter 34 of Ezekiel. I'm taking the time before we get into Psalm 23 to establish this relationship that God delights in with us as his sheep. And sometimes we may not look at God in the shepherd. Uh, we may look at him more in a punitive way, perhaps as even a tyrant. Ezekiel 34, verse 11, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. The emphasis there, the double emphasis, I, I, is because early in the chapter, his sheep, his shepherds, have failed their duties to the sheep. And he says, I. I myself, you didn't do it, I will. I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. And I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their gazing land grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep 
And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. That's, that's our God. And us as his covenant people, as the sheep of his, of his pasture, he says these very same things to us. You move into the New Testament and you find the familiar John 10 passage where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And it's not just for the, the dispensation of the Old Testament or of the New Testament. As we go into eternity, we're still going to have a shepherding God. We're still going to be under the care of the shepherding God who has called us his sheep. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, we read this wonderful statement about the Lord Jesus. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Our God delights in being the shepherd of his people. And the staggering thing about that, which is I'm about to read to you, is what we are as sheep. Is what we are as sheep. That he would condescend and take us as his possession. And that he would shepherd us. Shepherd us. But he's not called just a good shepherd. He's also called the great shepherd. Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the, new, of the eternal covenant. And then we have Peter's exhortation of earthly shepherds, the caretakers of God's sheep in the church, 1 Peter 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd appears. So we have God declares he's a shepherd. Jesus declares he's the good shepherd. He's also the chief shepherd and the great shepherd. Now, I mentioned what's so staggering about this, and I want you to pay attention to this, because this is a picture of the condescending love of God, is that when you look at God and his willingness to take on forever the role of shepherding his people, that is magnified more when you realize what we are as sheep, what we are as sheep. I've been reading a few books in the last couple of weeks about shepherds and sheep. Uh, and, and I encourage you, you probably have already read Philip Keller's classic, When a Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. He has a trilogy that says the, the shepherd looks at the good shepherd. And so it's, and, and, uh, and, and the shepherd looks at the father's love. But at any rate, some of these things you, you uh, I read, I read uh, some things about the good shepherd from John Newton. And by the way, I want to put a plug in for John Newton. If you haven't read much of John Newton, I know he, uh, he was a great hymn writer, for sure. Read some of John Newton's letters. He had a great ministry of care, of letters. In fact, John Newton was the instrument God used to save William Cooper's life time after time after time. William Cooper, the great poet. This is what Newton says of us as, she as sheep. God's people, considered as individuals, are fitly described by the name of sheep. A sheep is a weak, defenseless, improvident creature, prone to wonder, and if once astray, is seldom known to return of its own accord. A sheep has neither strength to fight with the wolf, nor speed to escape from him, nor has it the foresight of the ant to provide its own sustenance. Such is our character and our situation. Unable to take care of ourselves, prone to wander from our resting place, exposed to enemies which we can neither withstand nor avoid, without resource in ourselves, and taught by daily experience the insufficiency of anything around us. Yet if this shepherd be our shepherd, weak and helpless as we are, we may be of good courage. And I hope that you understand is that we will never understand and grasp the wonderful relationship of the Lord Jesus as shepherd until we see ourselves as absolutely helpless sheep. Is you got to be, you got to know what a sheep is before you're going to cling to him and the resources in the good shepherd. Now, as I mentioned, God calls his pastors, his elders, and his church shepherds. Jeremiah 3.15, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart. That was a very familiar verse that was used in the ordination of Puritan pastors in the 17th century. Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. And we know that um, Paul exhorts the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Do you notice the order? 
A shepherd can't care for God's sheep unless he's caring for his own soul. And Paul would exhort them to watch over. And in 1 Peter, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he gives the exhortation that we are to shepherd the flock that is among you. It's important that you maintain the high standard which we have here and we will. Uh, Lord willing, we will. You must hold your shepherds accountable to being good shepherds. And they must pattern their ministry after the shepherd himself. Again, from John Newton. John Newton was a great pastor. His sermons, read his sermons, but I would argue that his greatest strength and his greatest legacy was he was a pastor. He cared for sheep. And it it was evident in his letters, many letters. Newton, as, as I said, a great pastor in his own right, he said this concerning the pastor. Quote, it is necessary and of the greatest importance to his character and his usefulness in ministry here and at the judgment seat of Christ, that he should have a shepherd's eye and a shepherd's heart. That should be the criteria of the pastor. A shepherd's eye to watch the flock and a shepherd's heart to care for the flock. So with all that background of seeing God willingly taking on the role of the shepherd, seeing how he has called us sheep, and then the responsibilities of pastors in churches to have a shepherd's heart and a shepherd's eye. Let's take a look and work our way through the 23rd Psalm. And I want to give you four truths, four truths in the, in the next 20 minutes or so concerning the relationship between the sheep and the good shepherd. And the first one is in verse 1, and that is the personal relationship with the shepherd. Now, here's the danger. You know that. And you could quote likely all of you could quote the 23rd Psalm. I remember reading it somewhere, and I don't don't know uh, what the source was, but there was was this professional actor, and, uh, and there was this, an old preacher, an old pastor, he'd been pastoring for a long time, um, and they were both going to read the 23rd Psalm, and the actor stood up, and with elegance, and just articulation, just beautifully just cited the 23rd Psalm. The, the preacher had to be helped up to the platform. He got up there, and he read the 23rd Psalm. He read it. It wasn't flamboyant like the, the actor, but it was so powerful to the people. And they asked the actor, they asked the person who just, just so professionally says, what's the difference you were elegant. You were able to articulate. You're a great communicator. But yet, here's this, this old man, this old pastor, and, and he, he, he gently works his way through the psalm. Through the psalm. And the actor looked at him and said, here's the difference. He knows the shepherd. He knows the shepherd. The question then is for us. This personal relationship with the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It's not the Lord is a shepherd. It's not the Lord is their shepherd. But is the Lord my shepherd? And we're going to find out how we can determine that. And it may not be comfortable. But we find that in John chapter 10, Jesus would would say, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. That means the Lord is their shepherd. The creator knows you by name, not just by creation, but by being a blood-bought sheep of his pasture. And John 10, 14, he would say, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Beloved, don't ever lose the wonder of the simplicity of what it means to be a Christian is that we have been bought by the precious blood of the good shepherd so that we could feed off of him and the pastors of his word, the pastors of, his, of, of prayer, of fellowship, and we can embrace this God in an intimacy that he so desires where we can cry out in the depths of our sorrow, in the depths of our pain, the Lord is my shepherd. 
And the Apostle Paul, as learned as he was, and as, as articulate as he was in his writings, he would, he, would, he would bring it all together in Galatians 2.20 with the personal pronouns that illustrates this wonderful personal relationship we have with the Good Shepherd. Paul would say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. At the end of the day, when you've been battled by the devil, and you've been battled by your flesh, and you've been battled by the world, and people have failed you right and left, you can lay your head on the pillow at night and say, the Lord is my shepherd. He loved me and gave himself for me. And that will carry you through every trial. That will carry you through every agony because of the personal relationship we have. The Lord is my shepherd. And the key with these verses, these personal pronouns that Paul would use in Galatians 2.20, and we find the Lord is my shepherd. Do you know why that's so important? Because one of the easiest things that we can do as Christian is to lose the fervency of first love. Is to lose the fervency of first love for the Lord Jesus. And the only way that you can keep first love aflame, it's not by you ramping up your Bible reading. It's not by you trying to do better in the Christian experience. Do you know how you maintain a fervency of first love? By striving to experience more and more of his love to you. By him revealing himself more. That's why I think that that Christians should pray Paul's Ephesian prayers daily. Ephesians chapter 1. That the Father may give us the spirit of wisdom and knowledge. That we might know the hope to which we're called. The riches of the inheritance and the power that works in us. And then you go over to chapter 3. And you see where Paul would pray that we would have strength in our inner being, that we would be rooted and grounded in love so that Christ might reveal to us the height, the depth, the width, and and just the magnitude of the fullness of his love. Friends, the greatest thing we need as Christians is to be constantly drinking at the bottomless well of God's love is to have a constant awareness of of the sweetness that comes when the Lord Jesus reveals himself through his word and through, through prayer of how much you are loved by this eternal God who has said, I am your shepherd. Now notice in verse 1 also, what happens to the sheep that understand the Lord is my shepherd? Not just quote a verse, but know it by experience. It says, I shall not want. That word want, it means I don't have any needs. I'm fully satisfied. I'm contented. Philip Keller, again, um, and as you know, he was an actual shepherd. I mean, he cared for sheep, so he writes these books on sheep and shepherd um, out, of, out, of a, out of an authority. Because he passed, he had a sheep farm for eight years, and he writes, he he actually expounds Psalm 23 from his experience of literal sheep. It's well worth your read, and it's not a difficult read. He said this concerning uh, the sheep that says, I shall not want. Quote, this is the sentiment of a sheep utterly satisfied with his owner, perfectly content with its lot in life. End quote. Here's I, here what I think is the difference. One of the things that I, I find plagues Christians, and I'm not immune to this either, there are too many Christians that are discontent. They're discontent with where they are in life. They're discontent with what they have in life. They're always looking for more, or they're always looking for something else. They're, always looking, they're, looking, they're, they're discontent in relationships. They're just discontented. Do you know sin, that discontent is a sin? Discontent, discontent says, you're not fulfilling my needs. Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. 
And then he says, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In some ways, that's connected to Psalm 23, 1. Be content with what you have. I shall not want. Why? Hebrews, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews, uh, Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take, we cannot take anything out of the world. Joey and I visited uh, someone in the hospital this afternoon, and we were talking about, you know, aging parents and, and how both of our parents have a lot of stuff. And, and she looked at us, and she said, no, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. And, you know, and it's true, isn't it, isn't it? It's just stuff. The Lord says, be content with what you have. And then 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8 says, But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Discontent, discontented Christians may know a lot about Christ, but not his sufficiency, and they will want. Contented Christians know Christ and his sufficiency, and they don't want. And that's exactly what the psalmist would tell us. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need in my shepherd. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be content with what you have. And so the question I would ask of you, are you content right now? You have food and clothing. Are you content? That's what Paul told Timothy. If we have food and clothing, then that's it. Be content. I would argue, and I don't say this as an indictment to you, because I need to be here too. I would say that if I'm going to confidently say the Lord is my shepherd, then there, I should be content. Because is not Jesus enough? I find it kind of um, a deception in my own life. I find him enough for my eternity, but I don't find him enough for my life. And the psalmist would say this personal relationship, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now look at verse 2. Here's the second thing that we would see. And there's three applications in this. Here's the second thing. Not only is the Lord is my shepherd, I am satisfied, I am content. The personal relationship. There's also the pastoral care. The pastoral care. And we would expect nothing less from the good shepherd. And the first one is the spiritual nourishment of the sheep. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I know you all can picture. I remember visiting the, uh, the highlands in Scotland. And we were touring through the countryside. And we saw all those sheep. They were everywhere. And, and they were in some pretty nice looking pastures. And you, you can picture this. I know you've seen this. You can picture these sheep. They don't have a care in the world. They're eating nice lush grass. They're drinking waters out of still waters. And this is the point I want to make. Literal sheep will not drink out of fast-flowing streams. I don't say that because I'm a shepherd. I read it. Is it from these shepherds? They said, you cannot get a sheep to drink out of a moving body of water. It has to be still. It has to be quiet. I thought, what a wonderful parallel in the Christian experience. Because when the, the, the psalmist says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, it's a picture, as I mentioned, of spiritual nourishment. The Christian cannot find spiritual nourishment in the word and prayer if they're attempting to drink out of the, flash, the fast-flowing streams of worldliness and busyness. You just can't. Worldliness and busyness will remove you from the pastures of the world, word, because you won't take the time. And you also won't be able to drink deeply at the wells of salvation, at the wells of the word, if you're constantly busy and in a hurry. We find throughout the Bible that the spiritual nourishment coming from the shepherd is in the word of God living and written in the Spirit of God. Job would say in the midst of his deep trial, 23, 12, I've not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. That's a pretty bold statement. Job basically says, I would rather starve physically 
because your word is far more important than food. Psalm 107, 9, he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. And what satisfies the longing soul? It is the living person of Christ revealed through the written word. Psalm 103, 2 through 5, it's the bless the Lord, O oh my soul, who satisfies you with good. What is the good? It's the soul satisfaction of himself. And of his word, Psalm 119, 50, this is my comfort and my affliction that your promise gives me life. That is the picture of, 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 of the green pastures and of the soul being nourished. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus t- says to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what does Jesus say concerning the coming of the Spirit? Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit. So the point I get here is that this verse, verse 2, and a part, yeah, verse 2, he shows us that this pastoral care, the good shepherd, he will lead us to the places of nourishment, being his word, being his person, being prayer, but he will not make you drink. He will not make you eat. And you can starve yourself. You can be a sick sheep. And that would be by your choice, not by the provision of the shepherd. But now look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. We find uh, the second application of the shepherd's pastoral care. And that is the spiritual restoration of his sheep. David would write, he restores my soul. And we know David went through many, many times that he needed this to be true. He needed the Lord to restore his soul. The word restore means it has, it has multiple meanings. There's two, there's two different meanings here. Um, one, the first one is to bring back to an original position. Or bring back to original function. Have you ever been so worn down by life? Worn down by trials? That you just felt like you just couldn't even function? Have you ever been so overwhelmed with grief or overwhelmed with discouragement that you wish in the morning you could just pull the covers over your head and let the world go by? Do you ever feel just so like you're drowning in life circumstances and you're just wrapped up in, in this fast pace of all, it seems like you're, everything's out of control and, and you just, your spiritual life is suffering so that you just, you can't even hardly pray? This is for you. He restores the soul. He brings it back to its original function. Every one of you have experienced, in different levels, what the sons of Korah write in Psalm 42. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? That is a good scenario to apply. He restores my soul. Again, from Philip Keller, he said this. There's an old English shepherd's term for a sheep that is turned over on its back and cannot get up by itself. It's called a cast down sheep. And there's not a person here that has not been cast down in your heart and your spirit at some time. And you need the good shepherd to restore you. He goes on. A cast down sheep is a very pathetic sight. Lying on its back, its feet in the air, it flays around frantically, struggling to stand up without success. It can't get itself turned up. Sometimes it will bleat a little for help, but generally it lies there lashing about in a frightened frustration. If the owner does not arrive on the scene within a reasonable short of time, the sheep will die. This is but another reason why it is so essential for careful sheepmen to look over his flock every day, counting them to see that they are all able to be up and on their feet. If one or two are missing, often the first thought to flash into his mind is, one of my sheep is cast down somewhere. I must go and search and set its feet on again. Friend, that's what Jesus does. He will lead the ninety-nine. And he will go find the cast down sheep. And if you're a cast down sheep tonight, the Lord is my shepherd. He will restore your soul. 
He will come to you. And through the nourishment of His Word, the nourishment uh, of prayer, even if you can't even have the words, He will come to you. And you will go from a cast down sheep lying on your back, can't, can't getting yourself up, to He'll write you back up. There's the spiritual restoration of the sheep. So we have the spiritual, the pastoral care in verses 2 and 3 of spiritual nourishment, of spiritual restoration. Also in verse 3, same word restores, we have the spiritual correction of his sheep. The word restore, it does mean to restore to, a, uh, to its original function. It also means to turn back. It has a sense of correction. Now look at verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You ever thought what that means? Why does a shepherd have a rod and a staff? The staff, we, we, we probably got that figured out. You ever, think, you ever think about the rod? You know why they had those two, those two uh, instruments as shepherds? The rod was a club. And the club was used to beat animals wanting to destroy the sheep. It was to beat off wolves. It was to beat off any, pre- any predator that wanted to, to, to destroy the sheep. One thing the shepherd never ever did was beat the sheep with the rod. Never did. And I know Christians that are struggling with the love of God and the, the, the God who loves them as a father and as a shepherd, they struggle with that and they look at him like he has a rod to beat them when they do something wrong. And don't, don't think, say, well, I've never thought like that. Is the devil can, can come to you and try to paint a very bad picture of God and that is not the God who is your shepherd. He doesn't beat sheep. And neither should his under-shepherds. Exhortation. Rebuke. But under-shepherds should never, ever target and beat sheep. Now, thank God we don't do that. But it's so easy. Is that when you're hurt by someone, you can use the word as a sword that cuts and not for good. And that's just not from a pulpit. One of the things that Francis Schaeffer went through, and I would encourage you to read as much as uh, Francis Schaeffer's uh, books as you can. And if you need any endorsement beyond me, talk to Will. Uh, he'll tell you that the same thing. Francis Schaeffer was a pastor for 10 years. And Francis Schaeffer resigned his pastorate. And the reason why he resigned his pastorate is because he saw among Christians there was no warmth, there was no devotion. There was no love. There was no encouragement. They were arguing and looking about what all was, what was wrong instead of encouraging people with what was right. And Schaefer got so dis- dis- discouraged because he would read his New Testament and he would saw, see Christians who could quote the Bible but weren't living the Bible. And it discouraged him so much that he got out of the pastorate. And then he said this in the biography. I also saw it missing in my own life. Where was the warmth of devotion the New Testament writes of? Where was the joy? Where was all that I was supposed to be as a Christian? Where was it? So he, he jettisoned the whole thing, and he goes to Switzerland. And he's up on a chalet with Edith, and his wife is really struggling with this, because as he told Edith, he said, listen, he says, i got to go back and reevaluate the whole thing. I'm going to go back to my agnostic days and see if this is real. Can you imagine that? She's a pastor's wife for 10 years, and he says, we're going back. I'm starting all over again. And he would walk in the meadows in the Switzerland mountains when, when it was nice weather and just ponder all these things. And then it was bad weather, he would pace the attic. And Edith writes about this in her book. He come to grips that it was indeed the truth and that Jesus was who he said he was. And he was revolutionized in his life. And out, out came Liabre, a ministry that has impacted so many young people for so long and still is doing the same thing. I say uh, all that to say all this. Is it the Lord will restore your soul not only when you're downcast, but when you are drifting, he will correct you. And the rod will not bring up on you. He will not correct you by the rod. The rod is for beating enemies, not sheep. Make sure you understand that. 
The staff is what the other uh, instrument is. And that staff, as you know, has got a crook on it. The purpose of the staff was for correction. And the shepherd would gently tap on a disobedient sheep. Now, if the sheep was a little bit more rebellious, like perhaps some of us are at times, then he would take the crook and he would grab its leg and he would pull it. We're not going to take the time, but read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 and 11. The Lord loves you so much as your shepherd that he will spare you no pain to conform you into the image of the shepherd. Our God is so committed to us more committed to us in our conformity to Christ than our earthly comfort. And he will never beat you with a rod. He will come to you with the gentleness that he is through the corrective measure of his staff. So he restores our soul for spiritual uh, correction as well as for spiritual restoration. You know, in Revelation 7, 17, I, I, I read that earlier. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Do you know what's absent in heaven? When we read that about the lamb being our, and he's going to shepherd us, there's no rod and staff. The shepherd doesn't have a rod and staff. Why? He doesn't need it. There's no more enemies for the rod to be used. And praise his name, we're done being corrected. We don't need the staff anymore. All right, let's hurry. Let's finish. Now, here's the third thing. And these will go quickly. Verses uh, 2 and 4. We see not only the personal relationship, the pastoral care, we also see the pastoral protection. The pastoral protection from the shepherd. And that is in two ways. One, his protective leadership. His protective leadership. Verse 4, uh, verse 2 through 4. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Notice how many times we see the word lead. He leads me beside still waters. Uh, verse 3. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And then if we were, and we won't, but you go to John chapter 10, it says the sheep, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And he goes before them. So we get the picture here of this protective leadership is that he's in front of the sheep. He's in front of them, sheep, making sure there's going to be nothing, no, no enemies, a frontal attack upon the flock. It's a word of protection from the front there are a group of Christians, and they were touring the Holy Land. The guy told the group about resident shepherds uh, in Palestine and how they care for their sheep. He described in the Holy Land, shepherds always lead their sheep, always from the front, always walking in front to face dangers, just like David's saying here. He's always protecting the sheep by going ahead of them. He barely got the last word out when, sure enough, around the corner of the street, he saw a man and his sheep on the hillside, and they started coming down through the street. As the crowd walked and observed the scene, something was amiss. There was no shepherd in front of the flock. The sheep were, were heading through the street, but there was no shepherd. And so the puzzled, uh, the puzzled tour, tourer, he quizzed the guide, says, you said the shepherds always lead from the, flock, lead from the front. Why is this one behind the flock? And appears to be driving them. The guide quickly responded. What I told you is true. However in this case. The man, the man behind the sheep. Is not the shepherd. He's the butcher. And he's driving them to slaughter. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads from the front. Friends all the paths. That you walk every day. And they'll be hard. And they may appear dangerous. And they're exhausting. But you need to understand that you're not walking alone and you're not leading yourself. You're being led. And you're being led by the shepherd. Our shepherd. My shepherd. So his protective leadership is part of his pastoral protection. His also his protective provision. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. This is a picture of food being served. David, David would say that the Lord is providing abundantly all that I need by way of nourishment. That's what this, the phrase um, prepare a table means to gather food, to cook it, 
To be anointed with oil was one, one use was a sign of being set apart. And the Lord has said he has set apart the godly for himself. He has set apart the sheep for himself. His, pro- his protective provision, what is so encouraging about this is that he provides for us the spiritual nourishment where in the midst of enemy territory, in the midst of, of a world that is hostile against him. So friends, when it says, I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, of the, I will fear no evil, you don't need to fear. You don't need to fear anything. Why? Because you not only have a shepherd who leads you, but a shepherd who provides you and, and gives you sustenance so that you can endure everything out there. You are invincible, as McShane said, until the Lord is done with you. And that doesn't mean to be presumptuous and live loosely. But it does mean that you prepare a table for me. You provided all the, the, all the strength. You provide me the abiding sense of the vine and the branches so that I can walk in a very dangerous world and not be afraid. And then finally, finally, verse 6, we have the pastoral presence of the shepherd. The pastoral presence of the shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not only is the shepherd before us, leading us, notice what's behind us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You know what that means? And I mentioned this to Barrett and Will before the service. Do you know what that means? You know what doesn't follow you? Your past sins your failures. The devil would get you to be mired in your failures of the past. And he would get you to be so fixed on your performance, which will always fall short. And he will have you looking over your shoulder and seeing how many times you've dishonored the Lord, how many times you've said things you shouldn't have said, how many places you went that you wish you didn't, how many things that happened in your life that you're ashamed of. And if the devil can get you to look to your past and all your failures, then you will not enjoy the good shepherd. And you will find yourself discouraged and falling prey to the occupational hazards that John Stott said. Learn to when you look over your shoulder, ask the Lord to let you see goodness and mercy. Because that's what follows you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of our life. And with him leading in the front and him following us in the back with goodness and mercy, we're in pretty good care. And where's that going to take us? All the way home to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We will be the sheep of his pasture with no more, no more headaches, no more dealing with the messiness of a sinful world and our own sin. And we will forever be in the presence of the lamb who said, I will shepherd my people. The Lord is my shepherd. May we truly not want. Let's pray. Father, what a great, great truth. And forgive us when we don't think more of this because we're so familiar with it. May you so burn these truths afresh within us that you indeed are a personal shepherd. That you indeed do provide the pastoral care that our souls need, nourishment, restoration, correction, And that we are safe. Yes, we live in the enemy territory, but we are safe by the pastoral protection of his leadership and his provision. And may we learn to walk ever so close, realizing his leadership in the front, his mercy and his goodness in the back. And may we ever, ever live for the glory of him who calls us his sheep. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand.